Yo, what's up everyone? Welcome to Small World and thank you for joining me with today's video. In this episode, I'm going to show you how to create an ultra realistic cabin diorama from scratch. I'll cover how to make a wooden frame from basswood, apply your own siding, make individual shingles, carve bricks from styrofoam, weather your paint with packing tape, make a complete interior, and much more. Let's get started with the frame. All the pieces are hand cut with a razor saw, and I start by cutting the pieces for the floor. I soften the hard edges with sandpaper, and then glue the perimeter of the frame together with super glue. Now I'm marking out the spacing of the floor joists. Then, I glue the other piece in place. I add the floor joists using the marks that I made, and each one is attached using super glue. I'm going to have a chimney and a fireplace on the last side, so I make sure to leave some room for it. Here's how the frame lines up with the plan drawing I created previously. Now I'm using the drawing to mark the placement of the wall studs on the sides of the cabin. The wider pieces are used on the corners and to determine the window and door placement while thinner pieces represent typical studs. I start by gluing the corners in place using super glue and a 1-2-3 block helps keep everything square. Next, I'm gluing the pieces for the top of the frame. With that finished, I start gluing all of the studs. The markings I made earlier makes this step go really quick. And this is what we have so far. I use an elevation drawing I created to mark and cut the rafters. They need to be notched to fit the frame properly, so I mark them and carefully cut them using an X-Acto blade. I glue the rafters together and add a piece for the collar tie. Then, I glue them in place on the frame on both sides. Now I'm gluing pieces to define the heights of the windows and doors. There will be a door on the front and the back of the cabin, and a window on the front and another on the left side. Next, I'm gluing in more studs on the upper half of the frame. Lastly, I add diagonal braces to the corners of the cabin. I had to notch these pieces to fit around the studs to get them to sit properly. Here's how the frame looks so far. As you can see, everything is relatively square and we have our key features like our windows and doors defined. Here, I'm gluing 8th inch by 8th inch pieces to the exterior of all the doors. This will act as our door trim and although it looks a bit too thick right now, it'll look perfect once the siding is glued in place. I create the siding using pieces of 1 32nd inch thick basswood that I cut into strips. First. I mark and cut the basswood to the length of the wall that I'm working on, and I cut them into strips from there. Each strip varies in width from a quarter inch to roughly a half inch, which is a huge range, but references of many old cabins show that siding was irregular, and it was much more common to see wider planks used instead of the now typical 4 inch to 6 inch wide siding. My reference image has lots of dry rot, so I emulate that by cutting rough and jagged shapes off the bottom of some of the pieces. I find that doing the step before gluing it on the cabin gives me more control, and it's a quick and easy way to build lots of character to your project. The detail you create in this step will help inform how you go about painting and weathering later on. Gluing the siding in place is pretty straightforward, it's just time consuming. Just make sure that you start from the bottom and work your way up the wall, 
overlapping your pieces slightly to get the desired width that you're looking for. Make sure to notch out or cut some pieces to fit around the doors and windows as you go. I try to keep some continuity with the dry rotted pieces. For instance, if part of one plank is rotted, then it makes sense for the pieces above that spot to have some rotting as well. Again, reference images are super important for this step as you can easily see how some pieces are much wider than others and this helps add some interest and variety to the cabin rather than just having a consistent pattern. Once I reach the roof line on the side of the cabin, I cut one end of the board to the angle of the rafter and I let the other side overhang. Then I'll go back and trim off the excess with the sharp X-Acto blade. As you can see, we're building up detail for the interior of the cabin at the same time when adding the siding, as the pattern is visible from both sides. This is something that you wouldn't get from a typical prefabricated clapboard wooden sheet, as the backing on those are typically flat. And this is how the siding turned out. As you can see, it's pretty clean with very few visible superglue spots showing. A couple here and there are nothing to worry about, but it's better to avoid them as they prevent the wood from accepting a wash that we'll add later. Also, you may notice I haven't added siding to one of the walls yet, but we'll add that once the chimney's glued in place. Now it's time to make the roof, and I actually created a bunch more of these rafter pieces the same way I made them earlier in the video. These pieces actually won't be glued to the building, which will allow for the roof to be removable. This will make sense in a minute. I had these rafters dry fitted in place, but they were a bit loose, so I shimmed them using some scrap pieces of wood so that they're snugly fit in place and they won't fall over. I apply glue to the interior six rafters, but not the outer two. Then, I add the sheathing planks to the glue, which is what we'll apply our shingles to later on. I simply just repeat the step for both sides of the roof. Lastly, the shims are removed and now you can see that the roof easily lifts off the cabin. Everything holds together nicely and it fits on the cabin perfectly. And now it's time for balsa wood shingles. I have a tutorial that goes into depth on how to cut and texture these shingles, so I'll just show you how I glue them in place. I just run a bead of super glue along the sheathing and place the shingles side by side in a row. I'm replicating old shake shingles and I'm not being too precise about aligning them perfectly. Some variation will sell the overall texture and effect that I'm going for. Also, I leave small gaps between the shingles because the wood grain is very pronounced. If I butt the shingles up against one another with no gap, as I should, you wouldn't see the break between the shingles and it would just look like a row of one piece of wood. This step is a lot like the siding. You start from the bottom and overlap each row as you work your way to the top. However, Shingles are much more time consuming considering how many go in each row, but I think the result is totally worth it. You can get such a unique look with more realism and texture than the pre-molded styrene sheets of shake shingles. Now that I'm reaching the peak of the roof on both sides, I apply longer shingles that overhang the peak on the back side of the cabin and shorter shingles to the front side of the cabin. This overhang is pretty common for older buildings to have and it would help protect from high winds and storms. This is how the completed shingles look, and I really like how the texture contrasts the wood of the clapboard siding. The next step is to make the chimney and fireplace from styrofoam. Unfortunately, I lost the footage of me cutting these pieces on my hot wire table, but I start by assembling some of these parts using some foam safe super glue. These pieces make up the bottom half of the chimney. Now, I'm making marks up the entire height of the chimney, spacing them an eighth of an inch apart. This is how tall each row of bricks will be. Next, I score each row using an X-Acto blade. Make sure to take your time with this step. It's super easy to make a mistake, but patience will lead to consistent results, which is very important when scribing brickwork. When it comes to wrapping the rows around the sides of the chimney, I make more marks at an eighth of an inch intervals, and I use a longer craft blade and roll it around the edge to meet the new marks. This process is repeated for the upper half of the chimney stack too. The fireplace is slightly different because I wanted to add a pattern above the opening, which is very common for these old brick fireplaces. The bricks are laid at an angle on both sides, and each side has six, 
In the middle, there's a triangular piece which fills the void. I widen the gaps between the bricks using a mechanical pencil. Now, I'm carving out some foam to make space for a wooden board that will be added later. Then, the 8th inch brick rows are added to the rest of the fireplace. I assemble these three foam rectangular pieces using some foam safe super glue, and I attach it to the top of the upper half of the chimney stack. This design is very typical amongst older historic buildings. Now it's time to scribe and define individual bricks. Each of my bricks are 3 eighths of an inch long, and I just scribe them with an X-Acto blade. It's important that your corners end on half bricks every other row so you can continue the brick pattern around the corners seamlessly and you won't have any weird brick dimensions or shapes. This step is important to get right because I think that inconsistent brickwork is an easy way to lose realism within your scale models. Like before, I widen the gaps of the bricks using a mechanical pencil which will help define the mortar joints. At the same time, I'm rounding off some of the sharp edges of the bricks which will help them look more natural and handmade, which is the look that I'm going for. Now I'm applying the foundation of the fireplace to the lower half of the chimney stack using foam safe super glue. I make sure that the lines meet up and I continue to widen the pattern on the other piece that I just glued on. To eliminate the seam between the two pieces, I dig out every other brick where the seam is visible using an X-Acto blade. I apply foam safe super glue to all the holes and then fill the gaps with individual foam bricks that I cut out. It's not perfect, but I think it does a good job of selling the idea that the brick pattern is continuous across the separate parts. This is what we have so far, and I think that the brick pattern is much more pronounced than before, and it seamlessly wraps around all the edges as it should. Now I use a ball of aluminum foil to add texture across the, all of the brick pattern. This helps add some more realism and variety to the otherwise rigid and repetitive texture. As you can see, the bricks are starting to look much older and worn at this point, emulating the handmade look that I'm going for, but it's still very precise and consistent like bricks should be. Now I'm adding super glue to the back of the fireplace and attaching it to the chimney. All of the steps for making a seamless transition between separate pieces are repeated for the fireplace. Some of you may be wondering why I didn't glue everything together and then scribe the texture of everything at once. I have a few reasons for keeping things separate, but to put it simply, I just found it, it was easier for me. You could totally assemble everything first and then do all the texturing at once. But I just found that I had more control adding the pieces one at a time and making sure each individual piece I added lined up properly. One more piece was added on top of the fireplace, and again the steps were more or less the same. I widened the lines with a pencil like before, but really the only difference was when I dug out and added bricks to hide the seam. They needed to match the pattern on the side and the front since it was a corner piece. Once the seam was fixed, I finished the texturing on this piece. The upper half of the chimney stack was finished in the same way, and I joined the two halves of the chimney using foam safe super glue. An additional row of bricks was added to the front of the fireplace, and here's the completed chimney. It took lots of time, but it was well worth it. I found it actually really relaxing to just sit back, listen to a podcast or music, and just carve some bricks. Not to mention small foam bricks just look really satisfying for some reason. I made these brick cubes using the same methods. These are going to be the raised brick foundation that the cabin sits on. Going back to the cabin, I add these trim pieces to the corners of the structure. And with that, here's the assembled cabin so far. The bricks are just test fitted in place and not glued down at this moment, and the flooring and fourth wall will be added later on. Now it's time to make the porch. I cut the sides of the porch at an angle to ensure that I get a proper slope. I glue four pieces together to make the perimeter of the porch, then I glue a couple pieces that our planks will sit on top of. Unfortunately, I don't have any footage of me applying the planks, but this is how it turned out. For the porch roof, I cut a few balsa wood strips and notched them to fit around a wooden beam. I glued them in place using super glue and a 1-2-3 block to keep everything square. Then, I glue more strips, which the roof will sit on top of. However, I decided that this roof will be made from tin rather than shingles, which will add some nice variety to the cabin. But we'll deal with the tin roof later on, and just finish the frame for now. And here's the completed frame. Now you can see why I cut some pieces at an angle earlier, 
when they sit up against the cabin, they slope downwards. And finally, we can start to paint. I pre soak the cabin by brushing on some water. This will help the wash flow across the surface and not leave any sharp stains or marks. The wash is made from cheap black acrylic paint, a touch of brown, and lots of water. I make sure to apply the wash over every surface, including the interior walls. Any spot that resists the wash is most likely a super glue stain, which is why I mentioned keeping your glue as neat as possible earlier. But they aren't too big of a deal because I'll be painting most of the cabin white after this step. Once the wash dries, you can see that the color becomes less saturated and replicates an old wood finish. Next, I apply a coat of chipping fluid to the surface. Once that dries, I start by applying cheap white acrylic paint to the surface. You want a relatively thick and heavy coat while being sure not to obscure too much detail or surface texture. When the paint is almost dry but still a little soft, I run my razor saw over the siding to create small tears in the paint. Then I take some packing tape, firmly press it down on the surface, and then peel it off which will lift some of the paint in a random realistic manner. I repeat this process on all of the exterior walls. I first learned this technique with the tape from Kathy Millett's channel, and I'll link her channel down below. I'm very pleased with the results because if you look at peeling paint on siding, you can usually see it peels in long horizontal patches across the planks. The tape replicates that perfectly. I didn't copy the technique exactly though. Kathy soaks the wood in mineral spirits to act as a resist so you can easily peel the paint. However, I think as long as the paint is fresh, and as long as you scrape the surface with a razor saw or sharp blade, the tape should have no problem peeling the paint. The chipping fluid comes into play when I want to have more control over the chipped areas, like my dry rotted planks. I wet the surface I want to chip with water, and then scrape away at the paint using an X-Acto blade. You could probably chip the entire surface this way if you wanted to, but it would take quite a long time. I actually used the chipping fluid method for the interior of the cabin. First, I painted everything white like the exterior. This took a bit longer to apply because I didn't want a buildup of excess paint in the corners of the frame, so I took my time and I made sure that the paint was applied evenly and smooth. Once the paint had dried, I used the chipping fluid method to weather the inside of the cabin. I chose this method for a couple reasons. One being that it would be more difficult to fit tape between the studs of the frame, but more importantly, I didn't want the paint to come off in huge flakes for the interior. The chipping should not be as large as what's on the exterior considering that it's not as exposed to the elements on the inside. It definitely makes sense for the old cabin to have weathered and worn paint. At first, I used the back of my X-Acto blade to chip the paint, but for whatever reason, I found it easier to use a needle file that I had lying around. You don't need to apply much pressure at all, and it's super easy to create several small chips with this technique. I wanted to leave the planks nailed to the rafters a bare wood finish for the interior. I decided that I would stain the wood a more vibrant color, considering wood not exposed to the sun typically retains more color, and that can be seen in many reference images. The porch was stained in the same way as the cabin by pre-wetting the surface and then applying an acrylic wash on top. However, I made the color slightly browner than what I used on the cabin to add some more variety. Once it was dry, I sanded the planks to give them a more worn finish, and to bring out some more wood grain texture. The sides of the porch were painted using the same white from the cabin, then it was chipped using the chipping fluid method again. The porch roof frame was stained with a much more vibrant acrylic wash. These pieces of wood would receive almost no fading from sunlight so they should keep a more vivid, orangey wood tone. Painting the bricks was a fun challenge for me. I've painted bricks several times in the past. In fact, I have a tutorial for making and painting foam bricks, but I never really tried replicating a specific brick finish. The bricks I'm making are Savannah Gray Brick, and despite the name, they aren't gray. However, they're much more browner, darker, and more desaturated than your typical red brick. I base coat all the bricks with a layer of burnt umber light acrylic paint. With the base coat dry, I mix black with the burnt umber color and apply it to the individual bricks to add some variety. There's no rhyme or reason to this step, just try to make it look random. 
Then, I repeat the previous step using a mix of burnt umber and deck tan to make a lighter color. You can vary the intensity of the color by applying at full strength or slightly diluted with water to achieve more variation in the color. Okay, at this point the bricks definitely don't look great, but you have to kind of push through and trust the process. Next, I give the bricks a quick dry brush using a mix of buff and deck tan. This helps slightly desaturate the bricks and highlights the texture that we created earlier with the aluminum foil. The mortar joints are filled with spackle, and it's probably my favorite part of making foam bricks. I just smear the spackle into all of the cracks using my fingers, and I just keep spreading it until the surface of the bricks are relatively clean and the joints are filled. It totally changes the overall look of the bricks and makes them look much more realistic. However, the real transformation comes with an overall wash of a mix of highly diluted buff and deck tan. It looks a little yellowish going on, but it'll dry to a nice dusty tan color. This step really helps unify all the different shades and tones of brick, and it turns the bright white mortar joints into a nice aged off-white color. Spots that would receive moisture buildup over time receive a black wash. I also apply the black wash inside the fireplace to imitate charcoal and soot that would accumulate on the surface. I took a flickering LED from a flameless candle and wired it to a AA battery pack with a switch so I could have fire in my fireplace. I apply a coat of white glue inside the fireplace and fill it with miniature wood pieces weathered with charcoal and black paint. I tried to cover up the LED bulb as much as I could while still letting light be visible when it was turned on. I made a rusty piece of metal using a strip of styrene and I glued it inside the top of the fireplace. A wooden strip was pressed into the notch that I created earlier in the fireplace. And here's the finished fireplace and chimney. I started painting the shingles by again applying a black acrylic wash. I more or less follow my shingle tutorial that I mentioned earlier, and I applied the washes to individual shingles in a variety of lighter colors while the shingles were still wet. I wanted less contrast, so I made an extremely diluted wash of deck tan and I applied it over all of the shingles. Once dry, I then sanded the shingles to bring out more wear and tear along with highlighting the wood grain texture. I didn't do this in my original tutorial, however, I think this step really added to the overall look of the roof for this cabin. This is how the shingles turned out and I'm really happy with the result. They look just like old faded wood but the pronounced texture really helps add interest and contrast to the entire surface of the shingles. I started to weather the cabin using several acrylic washes, mainly with Van Dyke Brown and Sap Green. I concentrated the effect towards the bottom edges of the cabin, where the moisture would accumulate in the humid and stormy months of the year. Once dry, I sanded over the wash with sandpaper, and I really liked the effect. Sanding as a weathering technique really came in handy throughout this project. I never really did it too much before, but anytime I wasn't happy with the weathering effect, sanding seemed to fix the problem for me. I still wanted some grime to the upper parts of the cabin walls, so I took the Van Dyke brown wash and diluted it much more. I applied it randomly to the surface and spread it around with my brush until I was happy with the look. Lastly, I diluted some raw sienna and I speckled it over the entire surface. This added a nice texture over the walls, and if I applied too much, I could easily brush it away with some water. Here's the final weathered effect on the exterior walls. I applied some of the sap green wash along with some green gold to the porch, and I was really liking the effect. Now I'm gluing the raised brick foundation in place using foam safe super glue. Each foam brick cube goes into the corners of the cabin. Foam safe super glue is applied to the chimney and pressed into place against the frame. With all of that in place, it's time to add the floors. I notched out the perimeter board so the floor would fit flush against the frame. Then, I used my razor saw to add a more pronounced wood grain texture to each floorboard. I brushed on a brown acrylic wash to the floor, then the edges were highlighted with sandpaper to bring out some more aging. 
I waited to install them until now because I wanted the color of the floors to be a different color from the black wash that I applied to the cabin earlier. Each floorboard was glued down using tacky glue. Finally, the siding of the fourth wall was finished in a similar manner, but using the same black wash that I used before. Each piece was coated with chipping fluid and then painted with white acrylic paint. I chipped the paint with packing tape like before. Each plank was glued into place like the previous walls. Installing the walls now gave me the most control over how the chimney would fit. If I applied the siding first and then cut it out to fit the chimney, I might have ended up with some ugly gaps between the siding and the chimney. All that was left was to blend the fourth wall in by weathering it to match the other walls. I made the tin porch roof using a sheet of 0.02 inch styrene and some half round 0.06 inch styrene strips. I just placed the strips on the sheet at half inch intervals, applied thin cement, and trimmed off the excess and repeated it along the entire sheet. This is how it looked after some gray primer, and I applied a coat of silver using all clad chrome on top of the dull gray surface. This made a nice bare metal finish that wasn't too shiny due to the base coat being a flat finish. Next, I applied some liquid latex randomly to the surface using a sponge. The roof will be base coated red, and my reference images showed the silver tin finish coming through where the red paint had chipped away. I sprayed on the red using Tamiya Red Lacquer paints. Once dry, I rubbed away the liquid latex and revealed the silver finish underneath. I weathered the red paint using enamel washes by AK and Ammo, along with some white oil paint. I didn't really have a solid plan coming into this, I just kind of stippled and sponged on some dust and rust enamel washes and did some of the heavy fading with the white oil paint. This took lots of back and forth until I finally came up with a result I was happy with. Here's the final tin roof surface, and I think it turned out pretty decent. With that out of the way, I glued the porch room place with super glue and then added the brick foundation pieces that held up the porch. Then, the porch roof frame was glued into place. Next, I added the wooden posts that support the porch roof frame. And then, the red tin roof was glued on top. I quickly weathered the posts that sit on the porch to blend them in. Shutters and doors were made by cutting sheets of basswood to the proper size, and then separating them into individual boards based off of reference images. Everything was then glued back together, stained with acrylic washes, and painted like everything else on the cabin. The shutters were painted haint blue, and the doors were painted white like my reference images. They were chipped using the chipping fluid method, and then I applied one shutter to the side window, and both the doors were glued in place, swung open so you can see through the doorways. The base of the cabin is just a piece of XBS foam, and I lined the edges with black foam core to make the sides more consistent. I notched the corners so the foam core lined up nice and neat. Any gaps along the top edge were filled with spackle, and the base looked like this after this step. I applied some cheap black and brown acrylic paint over the entire surface. I'll be applying a homemade dirt paste on top of this, but the paint is a good base coat in case I miss a spot with the paste. The paste is made using real dirt, sand, and plaster which are mixed together first. Then I add lots of matte mod podge and some water and mix it until I get a nice spreadable consistency. I go more in depth about this in my static grass tutorial. Then, it's as simple as stippling the paste over the entire surface. While the paste is still wet, I sprinkle on some more sand and dry dirt, which will soak up excess moisture and add more texture to the ground. I apply some 5 minute epoxy to where the brick foundation will sit, and then I glue the cabin in place. Any gaps between the ground and the bricks are filled with leftover dirt paste to create a seamless transition. Nothing says scale model more than a big gap between your building and the ground, so it's best to make sure you fill all the gaps. I wanted to add a log pile on the side of the cabin, so I chopped up a stick I found outside. I used some white glue and quickly built up a mini wood pile. I made and painted some basswood steps from leftover scrap wood, and then I glued them to the front and the back of the cabin. And here's what the dirt paste looks like completely dry. Now I'm applying some static grass to the surface. Again, I have a more detailed tutorial on how to do this, but I'm basically just brushing on some matte Mod Podge and applying some 2mm 
four millimeter and seven millimeter static grass in layers. Excess static grass is vacuumed up with a stocking over the front so I can save and reuse the loose grass. The static grass is layered by applying diluted Mod Podge from a pipette and then using the static grass applicator to apply another layer of grass on top. This is the grass after it's fully dried, and while it looks nice, the colors of the dirt and grass don't seem to fit the aesthetic of the cabin, and there's some dark lines from glue stains on the dirt. I think the grass is way too vibrant, so I apply highly diluted flat earth by Tamiya randomly to the grass. I learned this technique from Boomer Diorama, and I highly recommend you try this technique. You can add so much variety with just one color, not to mention you can use any color that you like. Check out the painted grass on the left side versus the unpainted grass on the right side. I continue to apply the highly diluted paint and random patches all over the grass. I lighten the dirt trails and patches using the same method but with highly diluted Tamiya buff. Again, this technique really transforms the piece and it's so much fun. This gives you so much control over the final product and you don't have to worry about owning every shade of static grass or finding the perfect color of dirt or tile grout for your project. Lastly, it's time to add all the little details to the cabin, and here are a bunch of small details that I 3D modeled, printed, and painted for this project. If you're interested in 3D printing these for yourselves, all of the files will be available for download on my Patreon, link in the description below. The barrel and spoons were actually from Thingiverse though, so I'll link those in the description too. I glue on a bunch of tin plates and cups, wooden bowls, cast iron pans, and a jug to the table. Then, I glue the beds and all the other furnishings like the stools, chairs, and tables in place. I glue a small hatchet to the top of the barrel, and then I paint the metal hoops in a rusty metal finish. I add an axe, some chairs, and some plates and cups to the front porch, and with that, the cabin is finished. I took the model outside to a local park and got these shots of the final result. It was very rewarding to see how it finally looked finished and out in the sun. For anyone that's curious, I built several cabins like this before. I helped make models for an Amazon Limited series called the Underground Railroad, and I made the models of the slave cabins for the plantation set. With this specific cabin, I changed quite a few of the design features and I sourced my own references. It was definitely lots of fun to not be limited to time constraints and to use my own art direction to make it look the way I envisioned it and more accurate to reality. Also, let me know what you think of the diorama as well as the longer videos. To be honest, I personally like making the complete dioramas rather than the simple technique tutorials because the end result is much more fulfilling and I am able to cram several techniques into one video. I'll be making more diorama videos in the future, but with that, I probably won't be posting every week anymore. Maybe once or twice a month, but again, I think the videos will be totally worth it. Also, thank you so much to my awesome patrons. Your support really helps fund these projects because making dioramas isn't the cheapest hobby in the world. My patrons really help make these projects more affordable and I'm so grateful for that. If you'd like to join them and support me on Patreon, I'll have a link in the description below. Depending on what tier you select, you'll have access to behind the scenes pictures of whatever project I'm working on before I post on any other platform. Also, the STL files of all the furniture in this video, as well as files for my other projects are available for download on Patreon. Anyways, thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next video.